The new year started well for von Richthofen. Christmas had been pleasant when Manfred's father, the Major, took leave from the small garrison he commanded near Lille and joined his son at Yastabolka. In addition, Manfred's younger brother Lothar secured leave from the flying school he was attending to join the two older von Richthofens. Lothar, two and a half years younger than Manfred, had followed his brother into the air service and had first served as an observer throughout the Battle of the Somme. He made his solo on the day after Christmas 1916 with both his brother and his father in attendance. Although the weather was atrocious as the new year rolled around, Manfred managed to get airborne and into combat on January 4th. His 16th victory was over a Sopwith pup belonging to Royal Naval Squadron No. 8. The Sopwith was a new type von Richthofen had never encountered before, and he duly noted the British scout's superior performance in his combat report, writing, Only because we were three against one did we detect the enemy's weak points. When von Richthofen finally managed to get behind the Sopwith, it went down breaking apart and shedding its wings as it fell. In typical fashion, Manfred managed to recover the plane's serial number for his trophy collection. Victory number 16 was to be von Richthofen's last combat in an Albatross D2. Three days after shooting down the Sopwith pup, Yasta Bolka began receiving its first allotment of the Fatherland's newest fighter, the Albatross D3. Slightly larger than its predecessor, the D3 offered vast improvements, being faster, more maneuverable, and appreciably stronger. The new plane would quickly become the weapon of choice amongst the German flyers. On January 14th, orders arrived naming Manfred von Richthofen as the new commander of Jagdstaffel 11, based northeast of Donne. Two days later, another telegram from headquarters arrived, awarding him the Order of the Poor Lemerit. It was exactly one year to the day since Bolka and Immelmann had each received their Blue Max. Yasta 11 had been formed three months earlier, but due to poor training and lackluster leadership, had so far not scored any victories. It would be von Richthofen's job to turn the squadron into a first-class fighting unit. Upon arriving at his new command, von Richthofen found a willing, if not experienced, group of flyers. There was Karl Almenroder, the son of a Lutheran pastor who'd been studying to be a doctor when the war had interrupted his plans, and Karl Emil Schaefer, a 27-year-old Bavarian who, like von Richthofen, had begun the war on the ground. Kurt Wolf was a frail, popular 21-year-old who'd been with the Yasta since the previous November, but, like the rest of his squadron mates, had failed to score even a single victory. Under the tutelage of von Richthofen, these men would soon join the ranks of some of Germany's most celebrated airmen. Just as Manfred von Richthofen had devoted himself to learning all he could from his master, the great Oswald Bolka, he now became the teacher himself. With von Richthofen leading, his pilots became eager students, and the results were immediate. As the confidence of Yasta 11 grew, its victory tally against the British began to climb. Von Richthofen would often lead the entire squadron in formation, sometimes sitting at the head of a dozen machines. Traditionally, a flight leader would attach colored streamers to the struts of his airplane to more easily identify himself to his pilots, 
But in the excitement of battle, with planes spinning and mixing in a free-for-all, the identification streamers might be difficult to discern. In a moment of inspiration, von Richthofen had his albatross fighter painted bright red from nose to tail. Now there would be no mistaking which machine Manfred flew. Before long, every British flyer would come to fear the all-red machine, and the legend of the Red Baron was born. Eventually, the other flyers of Yasta 11 would also begin customizing their aircraft with a myriad of individual colors and designs. James McCudden, the Kent native who'd arrived with the Royal Flying Corps in France during the opening weeks of the war, had made the transition from mechanic to observer, and then finally to pilot, winning his flyer's certificate at the beginning of 1916. By 1917, McCudden was a seasoned flyer, having served first in a two-seater unit and then on to Havilland Scouts. In February, McCudden was back in England instructing pupils at Joyce Green, an advanced training school. One student who passed through the school and was to leave a lasting impression on McCudden was Edward Coringham Manock. Mick Manock, born in 1887 of Scottish and Irish extraction, had come from a difficult background. Manock's father had abandoned the family when Mick was 12 years old. After being raised in near poverty, he signed on as an apprentice lineman for the British Telephone Company. Mick was working in Turkey when the war began, and Turkey, being allied with the Axis powers, promptly put Manock into a labor camp. After several failed escape attempts, he was thrown into a prison cell where his health steadily deteriorated. In April of 1915, his captors, believing that Manock could be of little help to the enemy war effort, repatriated him as part of a prisoner exchange. Back in England, Manock's proficiency in telephone communications landed him in a Royal Engineering Battalion, but what he really wanted to do was kill Germans. His imagination fired after reading about the exploits of Lano Hawker and Albert Ball, Manock put in his request for transfer to flying. At 29 years old, Mick was rather old for aviation, and the fact that he possessed only one good eye didn't make his acceptance into the RFC seem very likely. A very determined Manock somehow managed to talk the medical examiner into approving him fit for training, and in August of 1916, he reported to Hendon for ground school. Flying didn't come easily to Edward Manock, but he approached his training with a seriousness of purpose that left an impression on everyone he met. A lean, hard-bitten fellow with a piercing gaze, Mick rarely smiled, and although he was a man of few words, he was quick to extol his hatred of the Germans, who he maintained were a race of vermin to be exterminated. By the time Manock came under McCudden's tutelage at Joyce Green, he was a fair pilot but not very proficient in his landing skills. Later, when Manock was to sit atop the list of British aces, he would routinely keep his mechanics and riggers busy, replacing propellers and repairing the broken undercarriages of machines he'd manhandled to the ground. On March 10th, Lothar von Richthofen reported for duty at his brother's squadron, Jagdstaffel 11. For Manfred, now the undisputed leader amongst the German aces, with 25 victories, it had been no problem to arrange for his younger brother's posting to the unit. In temperament, the brothers were very different from one another. While Manfred was the quintessential Prussian aristocrat, reserved and professional, Lothar was outgoing and likable, the life of any party and highly popular with his squadron mates. Lothar was also somewhat of a playboy and enjoyed the company of women whenever the opportunity availed. In the air, the brothers' styles showed marked differences as well. Manfred had established his career with the instinctive cunning of a seasoned hunter, with great patience and never attacking from the position of a disadvantage. The older von Richthofen didn't believe in taking risks. Lothar, on the other hand, was somewhat of a hothead in the air, bold, impulsive, and all too quick to hurl himself at the enemy, regardless of tactical situation or odds. It was the younger von Richthofen's not-too-subtle aggressiveness that led his older brother to dub him the Butcher. Just as Manfred had learned the business of air fighting from Oswald Bolka, Lothar learned from his famous brother. Three weeks after joining Yasta 11, Lothar scored his first victory when he dispatched an FE-2B on the German side of the lines near Lenz. With Lothar's arrival at the front, 
There was little time to get attuned for the ferocity the air war would adopt the following month when the British launched their offensive at Arras. Bloody April, as it would become known immediately afterwards, would be a devastating month for the Royal Flying Corps, while at the same time being a fantastic period for their German counterparts, including the von Richthofen brothers. With the war now in its fourth year, the outlook on the Western Front remained as bleak as ever. Despite the huge campaigns the previous year, the line had not moved more than a few miles in either direction, east or west. A huge scar in the earth still ran from the English Channel to the Swiss frontier, a gruesome 350-mile belt of trenches, dugouts, barbed wire, machine gun nests, and mud. Miles and miles of mud. The hard spring rains had soaked into the churn moonscape and filled the thousands of shell craters with a nightmarish slime that had claimed men and equipment at an alarming rate. The main British campaign for 1917 was centered in the Flanders region of Belgium, a large, flat, water-soaked area east of Arras. The Battle of Arras began on April 9th, but after an initial gain of four miles ground to a halt, mired in a sea of mud and having already claimed 160,000 British casualties. The air campaign launched in support of the ground offensive was an immense undertaking for the Royal Flying Corps. 50 British squadrons, made up of 750 machines, were arrayed along the front where the battle would commence. One-third of the aircraft were fighters, sopped with pups, French-built spads and Newports, de Havilland twos, and some of the newly arrived sop with triplanes. The two-seater outfits were equipped with various types as well, sop with strutters, FE2 pushers, and Royal Aircraft Factory RE8s. The bulk of the frontline units were still flying BE2s though, the awful quirks which should have been retired from service a year and a half earlier. Built in such vast numbers, these relics continued to fly long past their usefulness and their demoralized air crews longed for the day when the quirks would be retired from service. The coming battle would effectively fulfill their wishes. On the German side of the line, the Jagdstaffeln stood ready for the coming offensive. A dozen squadrons made up of 114 frontline fighters sat opposite the offensive armada assembled by the Royal Flying Corps. The Yasta system that Oswald Bolka had helped develop the previous year had created a fighting force of highly trained pilots and an advanced set of aerial tactics that would offset the numerical superiority possessed by their British counterparts. The month of April began without the slightest hint of the ferocity the air battle would assume over the coming days. Broken clouds and intermittent rain had kept aerial operations to a minimum and the skies over the front were genuinely quiet. History records British losses for April 1st at two aircraft, an FE-2 Fee and a BE-2. The latter machine, a quirk belonging to number 15 squadron, had been performing an artillery observation when a lone albatross fighter had popped out of a low cloud and latched onto its tail. The Germans' initial burst wounded the quirk's pilot, Captain Arthur Wynne. As the observer, Lieutenant Mackenzie swung his gun to and fro to fend off the attacker, a second burst slammed into his chest and killed him. The British machine fell just inside the Allied side of the lines, whereupon the albatross proceeded to dive down upon and strafe the wreckage. The German victor was Oberleutnant Werner Foss, all of 19 years old, and the quirk he dispatched had been his 23rd official kill. Werner Foss was born in the town of Creefield, near the Dutch border in 1897, the eldest son of an industrial dyer. Barely 17 when the war began, Foss immediately enlisted as a ground soldier and performed with distinction on the Eastern Front, winning both the Iron Cross first and second class before transferring to aviation. In November 1916, a month after the death of the great Oswald Bolka, Foss arrived at Yasta II, having recently earned his wings as a Jagdflieger. Even as a member of Germany's greatest fighter squadron, it did not take Foss long to establish himself as one of the best pilots in Yasta Bolka. Superb flying and a keen eye for shooting were attributes the young man possessed in abundance, and before the month was over, Foss had knocked down two British machines 
and was on his way to proving himself as, arguably, the most gifted flyer of the war. When von Richthofen left Jastabolka a month later to take command of his own squadron, Foss took the Baron's place as a flight leader. The harsh December weather curtailed most of the frontline flying, and Foss scored only once during that month, downing a quirk which fell inside the German lines. As the weather improved in February, however, the still 18-year-old Foss flew almost non-stop and drove down another eight enemy machines, bringing his score to 11. March turned out to be a remarkable month for the talented young man as he added yet another 11 victories to his score. As the great air battle of April 1917 began, Werner Foss stood poised for a remarkable career that would culminate five months later in what remains one of the most celebrated dogfights in the history of warfare. The Ares campaign proved to be a tragedy for the Royal Flying Corps. By the end of the month, they were to lose over 900 pilots and observers, fully one-third of their air crews. Hopelessly outclassed by their German counterparts, squadron after squadron of fees and quirks were decimated as they attempted to carry out their missions in support of the battle raging on the ground. It was an amazing period for the German fighter pilots, described by one flyer as like sharks feeding on minnows. Scores of obsolete reconnaissance machines and outgunned British fighters flew daily against the packs of the newest Albatross fighters, led by the most experienced Yasta leaders. Virtually all the fighting was on the German side of the lines, which usually assured that the German victory claims got confirmed as the wreckage of British machines littered down on their side. For the British flyers, the prevailing westerly winds inevitably made the homeward journey a slow, nightmarish affair. Von Richthofen had divided Yast 11 into two flights, and while one of these Ketten would be up patrolling, the other would be on hand at the airfield ready to scramble aloft if needed. On April 5th, the Red Baron led his Keta of five planes into the air after the telephone rang and reported a flight of six English two-seaters crossing the lines. The enemy planes were a type he'd never seen before. The planes were Bristol F-2Bs, a new design the High Command was pinning great hopes on. The Brisfit, as the planes would soon be called by their crews, had been designed to operate as a two-seat fighter. A 190-horsepower Rolls-Royce Falcon engine pulled the sturdy machine to the respectable speed of 115 miles per hour, and although large for a fighter, the new Bristol possessed decent maneuverability and a good rate of climb. The most promising feature of this new fighter was the armament. The pilot had use of a synchronized Vickers machine gun while the observer defended the tail of the plane with a pair of ring-mounted Lewises. While the Bristol F-2B represented a radical departure in the development of the fighter, the tactics employed by the first Brisfit crews would fail them, and the operational career of the new machines would begin disastrously. Number 48 Squadron was the unit given the honor of testing the new machine in battle. The commander of Number 48 was Captain W. Leif Robinson, who'd been awarded the Victoria Cross the previous year for being the first pilot to shoot down a Zeppelin over English soil. On April 5th, Robinson was leading his six Brisfits over the lines for the first time when he encountered the five fighters of Yasta 11, led by the bright red Albatross. Accustomed to the standard tactics employed by two-seaters, the Bristols pulled into a tight defensive formation, and within minutes, the Germans claimed four victories over their foes. Two of the machines fell before von Richthofen's guns, bringing his score to 36. Captain Robinson was forced down by Lieutenant Festner of Yasta 11 and was to spend the rest of the war in captivity. By now, Manfred von Richthofen's word was taken as the gospel by the German fighter service, and when he reported that the new Bristols possessed no threat, his opinion was passed on to the other frontline units. Von Richthofen's initial report concerning the Brisfit would not be without its consequences. When the Royal Flying Corps changed their tactics and began using the large fighter in a more offensive role, the machine proved itself highly successful, and quite a few German airmen met their fate by not taking the Bristol's threat seriously.
One British airplane that was holding its own during the Aris campaign was the Sopwith triplane, which after being declined by the Royal Flying Corps finally found acceptance in Royal Naval Squadrons No. 1 and No. 8. Although they made their appearance in relatively small numbers, the triplane could handily outperform the Albatross scouts in such wide use with the enemy. It could outclimb and outturn the mainstay German fighter and was 15 miles an hour faster. As was typical of the English fighters of the day, the newest Sopwith was equipped with only one machine gun, whereas the German machines greatly benefited from the increased firepower their two guns offered. As reports of the Sopwith triplane's splendid performance began to trickle back from the front lines, there was discussion amongst the high command, and a notice was soon issued to the chief German aircraft manufacturers that the concept of a German-built triplane should be explored. Well, the Albatross and Fouts firms did experiment with three-winged planes based on their existing fighters, it was Anthony Fokker's gifted design team at Schwerin that would eventually turn out a German triple-decker. On April 7th, two days after his fight with the new Bristol fighters, Manfred von Richthofen was promoted to the rank of Rittmeister, cavalry captain. To celebrate the promotion, Manfred went aloft in a factory fresh new albatross and sent a Newport fighter down in flames. Hunting alongside the master, Kurt Wolf had scored his seventh victory and Emil Schaefer had bagged his 12th kill. On the same day von Richthofen received his promotion, Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, announced a formal declaration of war against the Central Powers and America was finally committed to the fight against Imperial Germany. While sympathies had run strong for England and France, America had steadfastly managed to maintain her neutrality. After the British passenger liner Lusitania was torpedoed and sunk with 114 Americans on board, public opinion had grown steadily in favor of America's entry into the war. On March 1st, the famed Zimmerman telegram had been made public to further the outrage of the American people. The telegram had been a secret communique from the German foreign minister urging Mexico to join in an alliance against the United States. For the moment, America's declaration had little impact on the daily routine of the war. It wouldn't be until early November that American troops would actually appear in battle. But with war declared, thousands of young Americans queued up in the enlistment lines as the nation began preparing to join in on the great European conflict. The American public had eagerly followed the story of the Great War being raged in the skies over France. The exploits of the Lafayette Escadrille and the famous Aces had captured the public's imagination and spurred hundreds of young men to sail for France, hoping to join the famous squadron. Others had slipped over the Canadian border and enlisted with the Royal Flying Corps. By April 1917, the Lafayette Escadrille had been expanded to the Lafayette Flying Corps to accommodate the influx of new volunteers. While the Escadrille still operated as a uniquely American squadron fighting under the French flag, the Corps was set up to absorb the overflow of American volunteers into regular French units. James Norman Hall was 29 years old when he turned up at the French Flying School at Book to begin his lessons. Hall, a native of Colfax, Iowa, was a journalist who'd enlisted to fight with the British Army and had served in the trenches through the end of 1915, before returning home where he settled in Boston and lectured about the war. A book about his experiences, Kitchener's Mob, sold well, and when the Atlantic Monthly magazine suggested that Hall return to Europe to furnish a series of articles about the Lafayette Escadrille, he again set sail. Once in France, and after spending time with the famous American volunteers, Hall could not resist the lore of what he deemed a great adventure and wrangled his way into the service. Although he would initially serve with the Lafayette Escadrille, as the Corps expanded, Hall was reassigned to Escadrille SPAD No. 112, where he served until October before being transferred back to the All-American Group. After getting caught up in the story he'd been sent to cover for the Atlantic Monthly, Hall had never submitted the articles they'd hoped for, and after the war he would go on to pen a series of books both fact and fiction, about his adventures, including a massive two-volume history of the Lafayette Flying Corps. April had ended spectacularly well for the Red Baron. 
On the 29th, he downed four enemy machines, including one of the Sopwith triplanes belonging to Naval 8. 20 aircraft and 38 men had fallen victim to his guns since the beginning of the month, and his score now sat at 52 kills. Yasta 11 wasn't the only unit that had shown such stunning successes throughout April, but they'd certainly led the pack in scoring. Lothar von Richthofen had shot down 14 planes. Emil Schaefer had claimed 15 kills. Kurt Wolf, like his famous squadron leader, had destroyed 20 enemy planes. And Heinrich Gontermann had claimed another nine victories. The month ended and von Richthofen was ordered on leave. With a simple handshake, command of Yasta 11 was handed over to his brother before Manfred climbed into the back seat of an all-red albatross two-seater and began his trip home. Across the lines, the Royal Flying Corps was in shambles. With one-third of its machines and men wiped out, the average lifespan of a British flyer at the front had been a scant two weeks. Overworked and forced to fly machines that should have been condemned a year or more earlier, men had been pushed far past the breaking point and now seemed on the verge of a total collapse. By now, every Allied flyer knew about the Baron and his bright red albatross. All of von Richthofen's flyers had taken to painting their machines gaudily, and the British pilots had returned to their home airdromes bitterly recounting tales of having run into the circus. One flyer who found himself in combat against the most famous of the German squadrons was Billy Bishop. William Avery Bishop was born in 1894 at Owen Sound, a port town on the Georgian Bay in Ontario. As a youngster, Bishop had shown little indication that he would one day be famous. Somewhat of an underachiever, he'd performed poorly in school, preferring instead to apply his energies towards getting into trouble, shooting pool, and chasing girls. The one area Bishop did excel at was target shooting. A Christmas gift of a 22 caliber rifle was something that did catch the young man's interest, and he was soon demonstrating his proficiency by shooting squirrels from the trees around his neighborhood. Like many of his contemporaries, Bishop would never be more than, at best, an adequate pilot, but his marksmanship would serve to make him one of the most famous fighter pilots of the Great War. At 17, Bishop had secured entrance into the Royal Military College at Kingston, Ontario, where his poor academic progress left him in jeopardy of expulsion. The outbreak of war, however, created a demand for soldiers, and he found himself commissioned a lieutenant and sent to England with the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles. By the time Bishop arrived in France, it was not as a cavalry officer, but rather as a Royal Flying Corps observer with Number 21 Squadron. After four months of being chauffeured over the lines in a BE-2 quirk, without once ever having the opportunity to fire his gun at the enemy, Bishop was evacuated from France after a landing crash had damaged his knees. While still in an English hospital, he began applying for flight school, and upon his release, being declared fit for duty, Billy Bishop began training to be a Royal Flying Corps pilot. On March 17th, Bishop arrived back in France at Files Camp Farm, the home airfield of Number 60 Squadron, located 15 miles from the front. Although back in England now and working as an instructor, the squadron still carried the great ace Albert Ball on its pilot's roster. At the time, Ball had 31 official victories. 60 Squadron flew the tiny French-built Newport Scout, Eight days after arriving in France, Bishop scored over an albatross, which he chased down from 9,000 feet, firing until it slammed into the ground. The elation of his first victory was short-lived. Upon pulling out of the long dive, the Newport's Lerone engine sputtered and died, and Bishop was forced to glide back towards the lines, where he eventually came to Earth alongside an Allied anti-aircraft battery. Two days later, Bishop was back at Files Camp, receiving congratulations for his first kill which proved itself to be no fluke when he downed a second albatross on the last day of the month. Bloody April began, and Number 60 Squadron, like all the frontline British units, went on to suffer horrendous losses, with 18 of its pilots shot down during the month. By the middle of the month, Bishop was beginning to feel like an old-timer, as new faces arrived and then quickly departed from the ranks of the squadron. For Bishop, this terrible month was a period of stunning success, on the 7th, he caught another albatross at very low altitude and sent it crashing to the ground near Arras. 
On the very next day, he downed three more German planes. In all, Bishop destroyed a dozen enemy machines in April, including double victories on both the 22nd and the 23rd. In many of these combats, Bishop had dispatched his foes with no more than a few bullets fired, testament to his superlative marksmanship. The pilots of Number 60 Squadron operated in the same airspace as the brightly colored machines of Manfred von Richthofen's Flying Circus, and on the last day of the month, Bishop found himself locked in combat with the all-red albatross flown by the Fatherland's most famous ace. The engagement almost ended Billy Bishop's career when a skillful burst from the Baron's twin Spandaus smashed the Newport's instrument panel and splattered oil on Bishop's face. As von Richthofen passed below, Bishop kicked hard on the rudder, banked over steeply, and pounced on his foe. When he opened fire at 60 yards, the red albatross rolled over on its back and dove away to safety. Another pilot who arrived at the front just in time for the April massacre was Edward Mannock, posted to number 40 squadron. Like Bishop, Mannock found himself in a British squadron equipped with French-built Newports, but unlike the Canadian, his first combat success was slow in coming. Plagued with his one bad eye, Mannock spent countless hours in the gunnery pits, and it wasn't until a month later, during the first week of May, that his diligent practice finally paid off. Mannock's first victory was scored over an enemy observation balloon. Observation balloons had been employed to direct artillery fire up and down the front line since the early days of the war. Heavily defended by anti-aircraft guns, the gas-filled canvas bags would sway on the end of a steel cable, while an observer in a wicker basket provided the coordinates of the enemy positions via telephone. The balloons provided tempting but dangerous targets for the flyers of both sides. Attacking them involved flying through a hail of deadly ground fire, while its crew frantically attempted to pull the bag back to earth with a winch. Filled with hydrogen, the balloons were highly flammable, and incendiary ammunition had quickly been developed for use against them. For the pilot who survived the storm of fire coming up from the ground and managed to destroy the balloon, there was still the incredible hazard of the exploding gas bag to contend with. More than a few flyers were caught in the fireball and killed. On May 7th, after destroying the balloon that signaled the start of what would be a great career, an elated Mick Mannock raced back to his home airfield to spread the word. Upon arriving, he was greeted with a gloomy silence in the squadron mess. The greatest British ace of all, Albert Ball, had failed to return from a patrol over the lines. Albert Ball, after a stint at home in England training combat flyers, had returned to the front in early April, now posted to number 56 squadron. 56 had been formed to introduce the Royal Aircraft Factory's newest fighter, the SE-5, into action. The SE-5 was an impressive machine, fast, easy to fly, and built to absorb heavy punishment in battle. Originally introduced with a 150 horsepower Hispano Sueza engine, the plane would eventually reach speeds of nearly 140 miles per hour with later, higher powered variants. The plane was also the first British scout to come equipped with two machine guns. A single synchronized Vickers fired through the propeller, while a wing-mounted Lewis fired over the top wing. By the war's end, nearly 5,200 examples of this first-rate fighting machine would be built. When Albert Ball reported to 56 Squadron, he was assigned one of the unit's flights to command, a job the 20-year-old found irksome, as he'd always preferred hunting alone. Furthermore, Ball was initially unimpressed with the new SE-5 he was given, and arranged to have a Newport delivered for his personal use. When the tiny Newport proved incapable of keeping up with the new machines the men he was supposed to be leading were flying, he made the switch himself, and did indeed grow fond of the more powerful craft. In his short time with 56 Squadron, the young ace brought down four German aircraft, including a pair of Albatross fighters on April 22nd, which brought his official score to 44. On May 7th, Captain Albert Ball was shot down near the French village of Annalen. The exact details of his last flight remain a mystery to this day, but some facts are known. The skies over the front were very busy on that springtime evening, when Ball led a large patrol towards the vicinity of Cambrai. 
Multiple skirmishes left the SE-5s of number 56 squadron split up into smaller groups, and Ball was last seen by his men chasing an albatross into a large black cloud. Minutes later, his machine crashed to the ground near an abandoned farmhouse. Pulled from the wreckage by a local French girl, Ball was barely alive, having suffered a broken back and internal injuries. He passed away while still cradled in the young woman's arms. A few days after Ball fell, it was reported in the German press that Lothar von Richthofen, temporarily in charge of his famous brother's squadron, had shot down and killed the great English pilot. Well, the younger von Richthofen had indeed claimed a victory that day in the general area where Ball had fallen, Lothar's combat report had specified a SOP with triplanes shot down and destroyed. Triplanes belonging to Naval 8 Squadron had been operating in that same area that evening, but they had all returned safely to base and with no reported losses. Whether Lothar von Richthofen had shot down Albert Ball or not, the propaganda value was immense and Lothar was credited with his 20th victory. Ball was given a full military burial by his enemies. On May 13th, Lothar was himself knocked out of the air war. Hit by anti-aircraft fire, he was able to bring his albatross safely back to Earth, but severe wounds to his hip would keep him grounded for the next five months. Leadership of Yasta 11 was temporarily passed to Carl Almenroder, who at the time had 12 victories. In May, Royal Naval No. 10 Squadron became the third unit to be equipped with SOP with triplanes. Captain Raymond Collishaw, a native of British Columbia, had been flying in combat since 1916, and among other awards had won the French Croix de Guerre for destroying a pair of Fokker Eindeckers the previous year. By the time Naval 10 received their triplanes, Collishaw had been posted to the squadron and assigned as leader of its B flight. For the purpose of easy identification, the three flights of Naval 10 were designated by color, A flight being red, B flight assigned as black, and C flight bearing blue markings. The wheel covers of the machines were painted with the flight's corresponding color. With Collishaw's black flight, the metal engine cowlings were also painted black. Black flight was composed entirely of Canadians. Flight sub-lieutenants Alexander, Reed, Sherman, and Nash had all traveled from North America to serve the British cause, and under Collishaw's leadership, they would quickly prove themselves. When Naval 10 was relocated to Droglant at the beginning of June, Black Flight began running up a string of victories unmatched by any British unit at the time. Faced off against the albatrosses of the Flying Circus and other top-scoring Yastas, the pilots of Black Flight went wild. By June 6, Collishaw had blasted 16 enemy scouts from the skies, and every pilot in his flight had scored victories as well. Despite the sudden success the naval pilots were having with their SOP with triplanes, it remains a mystery why the Royal Flying Corps didn't begin using the machine as well. On June 25th, Black Flight suffered its first loss when Nash was shot down and made prisoner by Carl Almenroder of Yasta 11. Almenroder was one of von Richthofen's star pilots, having won the coveted Port Le Merit just 11 days earlier. He'd arrived at Yast 11 just a short time before Manfred von Richthofen had taken command, and by the end of April had learned his craft with nine victories to his credit. Seven weeks later, when he shot down the triplane flown by Nash, Almenroder's tally was brought up to 30 enemy planes destroyed. Nash would be his last victory, Two days later, he again met with the Sopwits of Black Flight and was shot down and killed, possibly by Raymond Collishaw. Confusion over the exact circumstances of Almenroder's death stemmed from the very long range at which Collishaw shot at the German. At the time, he hadn't even bothered to put in a claim for the kill. At any doubt, after being fired upon, Almenroder's albatross was seen to go into a shallow glide, which eventually steepened before crashing into no man's land. That night, a German infantry patrol had gone out and retrieved the ace's body, and he was taken home to the Rhineland and buried with honors. The Red Baron returned to the front in the middle of June. Six weeks out of the fighting had left him both physically and psychologically rested, and he was ready to get back into action. The time he'd spent at home had nearly overwhelmed him for all the attention he'd received. 
A good portion of von Richthofen's leave had been taken up with official duties, official parades, round after round of posing for photographs with various dignitaries, an audience with the Kaiser, and appearances before school children and military leaders. Wherever the Baron was slated to appear in public, he was greeted by throngs of admirers and well-wishers. The highlight of von Richthofen's brief vacation was a special invitation to hunt bison on the centuries-old estate of Hans Heinrich XI of Lower Silesia. Hunting on this estate was a very rare privilege and an honor usually reserved for the royal family alone. After the hunting excursion, it was back to Berlin for another endless round of presentations. Von Richthofen, ever shy and not completely comfortable with all the adoration, had managed to get home to Schweidnitz most weekends, where he could relax away from the public eye. These quieter times also enabled him to begin writing his memoirs, which would eventually be published under the title of Der Rote Kampflieger, The Red Battle Flyer. It wasn't just von Richthofen who wanted to get back to the front. From the time he left operations at the end of April, there had been a notable decline in the overall scoring of the Jagdstaffeln. In addition, German losses seemed to be on the increase, and a memo from the Kaiser himself expressed an interest in having von Richthofen return to his unit and set things right again. By the time Manfred finally reported back to Yasta 11, there had been two notable changes in the squadron. One was a new home airfield. On June 10th, the Yasta had moved to Bavashov, Belgium, northeast of Courtrai. The other change was the aircraft the squadron was now flying. The Albatross D-3s had been replaced with the newer Albatross D-5. While visibly very similar to its predecessor, the D-5 offered some improvements, including a 10 mile per hour speed increase. Unfortunately, as the German flyers would soon learn all too painfully, this newest fighter from the Albatross family would be plagued by repeated problems caused by a structural weakness in its lower wing. Back at the front, von Richthofen wasted no time getting into the swing of things. His 53rd victory, the first since the end of April, was an RE-8 artillery spotter that he sent down in flames on June 18th. On the 23rd, it was a French-built SPAD fighter. The following day, he shot down a new two-seater the British had recently introduced, the de Havilland 4, a machine capable of carrying 460 pounds of bombs. Von Richthofen had been leading a flight of his squadron's new Albatross fighters when he came upon a pair of the new bombers, escorted by the Sopwith triplanes of Naval 10's Black Flight, led by Raymond Collishaw. In the brief but spirited scrap, Collishaw scored a hit on one of the attacking Albatrosses, which broke up in the air. Von Richthofen's vanquished de Havilland fell on a nearby German airfield, where it crashed onto a hangar and erupted in a fireball. On the day von Richthofen bagged his 55th enemy machine, it was announced by the high command that he had been chosen to lead what would be Germany's first fighter wing, Jadgeschwader 1. JG-1 would be made up of four squadrons, Jastas 4, 6, 10, and 11, and would operate as an independent unit under the command of von Richthofen. The formation of a fighter wing was announced as a reaction to the recent deployment of vast numbers of new British squadrons to the front. The new Jadgeschwader would operate from a single airfield, and all the supporting equipment and personnel would be designed to be highly mobile, moving up and down the front as the need dictated. As for the Baron's replacement leading Yasta 11, Karl Almenroda had been selected to fill von Richthofen's position, but when Almenroda was killed on the 27th, Kurt Wolf was picked to lead the squadron in his place. Frail but easygoing, Wolf had been awarded his Blue Max in May for shooting down an impressive 27 enemy machines in seven weeks. Despite being barely 21 years of age, he proved to be a fine squadron leader, and when he was killed in combat two months later, his victory tally would sit at a respectable 34 kills. Von Richthofen had barely taken charge of his new command when he himself was shot down with a wound that would remove him from combat for six weeks. On July 6th, Manfred was leading a group of his scouts when he spotted a formation of six FE-2s from RFC No. 20 Squadron, midway between Ypres and Armentiers. For von Richthofen, attacking the slow, lumbering fees had become nearly a routine action. Of his 57 confirmed kills at the time, 11 of them had been over these very planes. 
As the Baron calmly moved into position on the rearmost enemy machine, he suddenly felt a great blow to his head as one of the rounds fired by the Fee's observer found its intended target. Temporarily blinded by the wound, von Richthofen's fighter dropped out of the fight in a spin, and as the altitude unwound, his vision gradually began to return. Weak and disoriented, he managed to set his albatross down safely in a large field, where German troops removed him from the plane and rushed him to St. Nicholas Hospital in Courtrai. It had been a close call for von Richthofen. Although his skull had not been penetrated, a large hole, about 10 centimeters long, had been gouged in his scalp, exposing the white bone underneath. The Red Baron would not return to combat until the middle of August. For propaganda purposes, his near-fatal encounter and subsequent absence from operations would remain a closely guarded secret kept from the public. In August, after a lengthy stay in England where he'd been instructing, James McCudden returned to France to join Number 56 Squadron. Since the death of Albert Ball four months earlier, 56 had stayed in the thick of battle, had established itself as the Royal Flying Corps' best squadron. The SE-5 fighters they'd introduced into the air war had more than held their own against the albatrosses flown by their foes. And the newest variant, the SE-5A, was the fastest fighter in service at the time. There were few men serving in the Flying Corps who had witnessed the airplane's technological advancement the way James McCudden had. Beginning with the antique Farman biplanes, McCudden had a first-hand acquaintance with virtually every major type of machine that had passed through the service. After nearly four years of serving in the Corps, it was with the SE-5A that the seasoned pilot would finally find his fame. By the time he joined Number 56 Squadron, McCudden was already an ace. Once aloft with his new unit, he began to steadily swat Germans from the air, doubling his score in his first two weeks back in action. In the end, McCudden was to score 52 of his 57 victories while flying the SE-5A. Another excellent English fighter to recently arrive at the front was the Sopwith Camel. Short and stubby in appearance, the Camel was the next great advancement of the line that had begun with the Sopwith Tabloid, first flown in 1912. A 130 horsepower Claget rotary engine powered the craft to 115 miles per hour, which was a respectable, if not remarkable, speed. That was only half the story. Owing to the shortened length of the airplane, the engineers of the Sopwith Company had created the world's most maneuverable fighter. They had also created a machine that was remarkably difficult to fly. Where the plane's direct descendant, the Pup, had been a joy to take aloft, the Camel was a machine that offered its pilot not a single moment of relaxation. The strong torque offered by its powerful rotary engine ensured that the plane would immediately whip into a right-handed spin unless its pilot kept up a constant pressure in the opposite direction. The planes were difficult to take off and even harder to land, needing to be literally flown to the ground at high speed. It's probable that more Camel pilots were killed due to accidents than enemy fire but the Royal Flying Corps did have a new first-class fighter nevertheless. Twin synchronized Vickers machine guns mounted under a metal cowl and gave the machine its hump, from which its name derived. Between July of 1917 and the armistice 16 months later, nearly 5,500 would be built and Camel pilots would account for some 1,300 victories. At Schwerin, Tony Falker and his talented engineering team had just finished putting the final touches on their triplane design, the first two examples of which were delivered to the front towards the end of August. Ever since the passing of Falker's Eindecker monoplane from favor a year and a half earlier, the Dutch designer had flown a series of biplanes which he'd hoped to sell to the German Air Force. Again, the failure of Fokker to produce the next generation of frontline fighters stemmed more from the unavailability of reliable engines than the aircraft he was testing. Still considered an outsider in Germany, his efforts to secure a share of the coveted Mercedes engines had proved futile. One engine that was available in abundance, though, was the Orberoso Rotary, a copy of the French Lerone. Inspired by the success of the enemy SOP with triplane, Fokker and his team went about designing a triple decker of their own. Their resulting dry decker, designated the DR-1, 
neatly circumvented the engine problem by creating a fighter that was exceptionally maneuverable and sported a remarkable rate of climb. With its short fuselage and stubby wings, the DR-1 could virtually turn around in its own length and climb a mile into the air in barely two minutes. Like all German fighters of the day, the plane was equipped with two forward-firing Spandau machine guns. The first two triplanes were delivered to Jagdgeschwader 1 for evaluation. Von Richthofen had returned to his command on August 16th, 40 days after he'd been shot down and wounded. One of the new Fokkers, painted bright red of course, had gone to him. The second Dreidecker was handed over to Werner Foss, now the acting commander of Yasta 10 and the victor of 38 air battles. Success while flying the new machine was quick in coming. On the first day of September, the Baron scored with the triplane, shooting down an RE-8 two-seater, which he'd been able to close on from behind without a single shot being fired at him. The RE-8's crew had probably assumed that it had been a Sopwith triplane behind them and had watched it approach without concern. On September 3rd, both von Richthofen and Voss each scored while flying their new triplanes. Von Richthofen's victory, his 61st, was over a Sopwith pup belonging to number 46 squadron. The Sopwith's pilot, Lieutenant A.F. Bird, managed to crash land his machine and was taken prisoner. Anthony Fokker, eagerly following the progress of his new machines at the front, drove with von Richthofen out to the crash site to pose for publicity photos with the wreck. Foss's victory that day, his 39th, was over a sop with Camel belonging to number 45 squadron. The new three-winged Fokker suited von Richthofen well enough, but in Werner Foss's hands, he had found the perfect weapon. Foss, a more natural flyer than von Richthofen, was quicker to realize the potential the aircraft's amazing maneuverability offered, and over the next eight days, he shot down eight enemy machines. Foss was von Richthofen's closest competitor in scoring, and when the Red Baron left the front later that month for further recuperation stemming from his July wounding, Foss saw von Richthofen's absence as an opportunity to perhaps take the lead. On the morning of September 23rd, Foss scored what would be both his 48th and his last victory when he led the pilots of Yasta 10 against the flight of de Havilland 4 bombers. Later that evening, while patrolling alone, he ran into a flight of five SE-5As belonging to number 56 squadron. Despite the lopsided odds, the German ace threw himself into battle against the enemy. What Foss couldn't have known was that he'd pitted himself against five of the Royal Flying Corps' more seasoned pilots, including James McCudden and Arthur Rise Davids. Rise Davids had been in the Flying Corps since early 1916, and after taking a period to learn the craft of air fighting, had begun steadily scoring over the Germans. By the time 56 Squadron ran into Werner Foss, Rise Davids' victory tally stood at 18 kills. Foss may have been outnumbered, but he definitely controlled the pace of the air battle. The handling of his Fokker astonished his opponents as he twisted and spun through and around the British formation. A red-nosed albatross fighter, flown by Karl Menkhoff of Yasta II, briefly joined in the fight, but was hit by Rise Davids and forced to drop out of the action with its engine dead. For 10 minutes, Foss kept the pilots of the five SE-5As sweating under the veracity of his attack and managed to put bullets into each one of the British machines. It was a remarkable exhibition of flying on the Germans' part, but in the end it was Rise Davids who eventually scored the hit that sent Foss and his Fokker triplane dropping out of the fight where it crashed to pieces inside the British side of the lines. English soldiers gave Foss a burial where his machine had fallen and the remains of his Fokker were removed to a British airfield to give the Allies their first look at the new German fighter. Two of the SE-5As Foss had fought were so damaged that they had to be written off from active duty. James McCudden later wrote that the German ace had been the bravest airman it had ever been his privilege to see fight. It was a fitting tribute to Werner Foss, who was only 20 years old at the time of his death. The French also lost one of their greatest flying heroes in September when George Guinemir fell. The first nine months of 1917 had been a busy period for Guinemir. 
At the beginning of the year, he traveled to the SPAD plant near Paris to work with the engineers on the installation of a 37 millimeter cannon designed to fire through the hub of the propeller. The weapon did work, but due to its slow rate of fire would not be adopted by the service. The average pilot simply lacked the skills to maneuver into the close firing position required to score with the weapon. In George Guinemere's hands, the cannon proved reasonably effective and he kept a SPAD with this armament as a backup machine. Springtime had been particularly fruitful. Guinemere flew his SPAD relentlessly and by the end of May, France's ace of aces stood with a score of 43 victories. Captain Brocard, leader of the famous Storks group, wanted Guinemere to retire from frontline flying or at the very least take an extended leave from combat. Never in the best of health to begin with, the young ace seemed physically to be on the decline. He'd grown even thinner, with his dark eyes sunken deep in their sockets. As fatigue had set in, Guinemere had grown more nervous and irritable on the ground. To those around him, it was obvious that Guinemere couldn't continue much longer at the pace he set for himself. On the last day of August, Guinemere reigned victorious over his 53rd opponent, a DFW which fell in flames over Poperingi. The following day he was notified that effective immediately he was to assume command of Escadrille SPAD No. 3. As a squadron leader, it was reasoned, Guinemere would have less time to fly. Guinemere hated his new job. Despite his wishes, he had been effectively removed from combat, and as the paperwork piled up on his desk, his favorite SPAD sat unused outside his office. By September 11th, it was all too much for the 23-year-old hero who climbed into the cockpit of his fighter at 8.25 a.m. and headed out towards the front. Guinemere never returned from this flight, and as the anxious hours turned into days, and then the days turned into weeks, France mourned the loss of their most beloved flyer. To this day, there is no schoolchild in France who doesn't know the legend of George Guinemere, who, they say, flew so high that the angels wouldn't let him return to Earth. Escadrille SPAD No. 103 of the Storks Group had received a replacement pilot in May who would go on to be both the highest scoring Allied pilot and the most successful flyer to survive the war. René Paul Fonck, born in 1894, was a trained engineer who'd taken up flying as a sport shortly before the outbreak of the Great War. Fonck spent the first year of the conflict engaged in bridge building, trench digging, and road repairing. The following year found him aloft over the front in Voison two-seaters, first as an observer and then finally as a pilot. Once he reached the Storks and their spads, Fonk immediately made his presence felt by the enemy. Within 12 days, he had become France's newest ace, having scored the requisite five kills to qualify. Fonk may well have been the best shot of the war. His marksmanship was remarkable. He never wasted ammunition, and many of the 75 kills he would eventually score were brought down with only a few bullets. As his victory score climbed through the remainder of 1917, so did his fame. But even after he'd surpassed the record of the great George Guinemere, he never received the worship or respect Guinemere had. The problem stemmed from René Fonck's inflated ego. Simply put, he was full of himself. Arrogant and boastful with the press and fellow flyers alike, people generally found him to be an intolerable braggart. Fonck would never receive the public adoration he sought even after his uniform stood bedecked with every medal his nation offered. Beginning towards the end of September, the weather grew worse than usual and the pace of the air war slowed. Likewise on the ground, the big campaigns had produced little results to bring the war to a conclusion and as soldiers on both sides began to again settle down for the coming winter, they could only wonder how much more warfare they'd be forced to endure. The last British push of the year was centered around the town of Cambrai, where tanks were used for the first time to breach the barbed wire in front trenches. Despite atrocious weather, SE-5As and SOP with camels flew non-stop throughout the battle, providing low-level strafing and bombing of German positions. By early December, the modest gains the British ground forces had made were re-lost to German counteroffensives. By November, German squadrons had begun the large-scale conversion to Fokker triplanes, but a series of accidents raised doubts about the plane's structural integrity, and for a brief period the dry deckers were grounded while further testing was ordered. 
Manfred von Richthofen went back to his albatross D5, and it was in this plane that he scored his 63rd and last victory of the year. His brother Lothar, having been out of combat for five months convalescing from wounds, returned to Yasta 11 in time to bring his score to 26 kills by the end of 1917. As they had the previous year, the von Richthofen brothers spent Christmas with their father, who joined them at the aerodrome. American troops had been arriving in France, and although an air service was being planned and organized, the United States possessed no modern airplane suitable for the demands of combat. When American squadrons did eventually become operational the following spring, it would be in French machines they were flying. <laughs> 